Yes, of course, it's yours. Thank you, Mariana. Um, hello, everybody. As uh, Mariana said, we are in different places, different time zones. So good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening. Um, and it's my pleasure on behalf of the Center for Urban History to welcome you to this Zoom online events, trans also uh, available on YouTube. With today's event and lecture, we're launching a series uh, of um, four lectures culminating in a, uh, in a conference where we will just discuss different ways so how Carpathians, the mountains spread across several countries right now, where imagined, traveled to, even sometimes and um, destroyed or radically altered uh, through the 19th and 20th century, and we will look mainly into arts and culture. So this topic of how we are the center for urban history, of how relations between the city and the countryside, uh, between urban and rural uh, were shaped and altered throughout this period were um, discussed. And it was really with the cooperation of St. Gallen universities that we gave it a shape uh, and a push to create um, a series of lectures uh, uh, this year. So I'm very happy and very glad with the, about the cooperation of St. Gallen University and specifically the Center for Governance and Culture in Europe. And uh, many thanks go to to um, Alexei Chabotaryov, who is a co-organizer of this um, series and the conference, whom you will hear in different role later today. Uh, and I'm very happy um, that the series is inaugurated with lecture by um, Dr. Patrice Dombrowski, but I am already stepping into the sphere of Bogdan Shumilovich, who will be moderating uh, this today's event. And very briefly, I will introduce him um, as he curating is curating this series and organizing both the the lectures and the conference, and we hope very much also co-editing the publication, uh, which will be forthcoming uh, this or next year. So Dr. Bogdan Shumilovic, researcher uh, and curator of public history programs at the center with focus on visual culture, media studies, and visuality at large. Uh, his, um, his research, his own research, and his recently defended PhD uh, dealt with both media and lands and mountains. Mm, so his, uh, uh, his work um, has titled Mediating Lands, Lending the Media and focused on television and popular culture in late Soviet Ukraine, the specific focus on, uh, on Western Ukraine, where we have a lot of Carpathians. So without much further ado, I am uh, I'm, uh, passing mic to Bogdan and looking forward for lecture and for discussion and for other lectures coming later. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Patrice Dombrowski, who will be the, the starting uh, lecturer uh, of the series of events that we, in general, frame uh, in English. It's Two Mountains from a City, Imagining Carpathians in Arts and Culture, in Ukrainian, Zmista Dohir, Vyobrazhenia Karpatu Kulturi Tamistes. So this will be a series of online lectures that will take place uh, over the spring of this year. And then at the end of June, we plan to have the offline event in the Carpathians. So this would be a hybrid event and we hope that we will learn a lot during this uh, very valuable event. So I'm coming closer to uh, Dr. Patrice Dombrowski. Uh, uh, Dr. Dombrowski is a historian with uh, degrees from Harvard University and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. She has taught and worked at Harvard, Brown, the University of Massachusetts, at Amherst at the University of Vienna, 
she is currently an associate of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. She is a member of the board of directors of the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences of America. And also she is an editor of Age Poland. Uh, Orient by training, Dr. Patrice Dombrowski developed a specific focus not only on the Polish history, but also on the history of the Carpathians or whatever, Atras, Bieszczady, whatever you call them from different angles. Uh, my, me, myself, personally, I learned a lot from the articles that I uh, had pleasure to read, published by uh, Dr. Dombrowski, especially uh, discovering the Galician borderlands, the case of Eastern Carpathians, uh, published in 2005, also constructing a Polish landscape, the example of Carpathian frontier in 2008, and uh, uh, very interesting uh, text also related to Soviet Soviet history or socialist history. In 2013, she published a text Encountering Poland's Wild West, Tourism in the Bieszczady Mountains under Socialism. So you see that Patrice Dombrowski has focused on, on the Carpathians from various angles, uh, using the old history from the 19th century and then the recent socialist history. And she is going to publish uh, the book we are waiting for. This is the forthcoming book, which is going to be out in 2021, in autumn of this year. And the title of this book is The Carpathians Discovering the Highlands of Poland and Ukraine. And we are very happy that Ukraine is there. Uh, and uh, the lecture of uh, Patrice uh, Dombrowski for today evening, uh, oh, sorry, in New York is <laughs> noon, uh, uh, the title is Discovering the Carpathian. So I'm, I'm very pleased to give the floor to Dr. Patrice Dombrowski and uh, uh, we hope for the very fruitful uh, discussion afterwards. Yes. Thank you, Bogdan, for that kind introduction and for the invitation to give the keynote address for your spring series. Can you see me? Okay, good, because I see you, Bogdan, so I'm not sure about that. Let me uh, uh, try to share my screen now. Hope this goes well. All right. And let me start. Can you see everything? Okay, wonderful. Well, today I will give you my own historical take on the series theme under the title, as Bogdan already mentioned, of Discovering the Carpathians. It's a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Discovering the Carpathians was the original title of my forthcoming book, which Cornell University Press retitled as The Carpathians, discovering the highlands of Poland and Ukraine. And here you see the beautiful cover of the book. As I think about this lecture series and how it has been conceptualized, it occurs to me that it is precisely the element of discovery about which I will speak today that provides the crucial linkage between the urban and rural city and country in the Carpathians. This certainly holds true for the ways in which people have encountered the mountains in the relatively recent past. Now, as a historian, the relatively recent past uh, means within the last century and a half, just so you realize. Uh, of course, one can find various peoples penetrating the mountains already many centuries ago, including those in search of passage, pasture land, precious metals, and even hidden treasure. Yet such things were pursued with trepidation in a period that Marjorie Hope Nicholson memorably termed mountain gloom. Less an urban rural split, a veritable chasm separated the lowlands from the highlands with few pe people venturing heavenward. And few people wanted to, so great was the fear that the mountains inspired. Indeed, there was no fascination with the mountains, which were avoided whenever possible. 
in the 18th century, mountains transitioned from being utterly terrifying to being sublime. Still, it took the romantic period for not mountain gloom, but rather mountain glory to shine in full splendor. This is when climbing the Alps really took off to the extent that the Alps were considered used up, that is crowded by the mid 19th century. My research into the Carpathian Mountains begins with a somewhat later period, the last quarter of the 19th century. This was an age of burgeoning mountain tourism, the beginnings of what I have labeled the discovery of the Carpathians. With the term mountain tourism, I mean to encompass two related but separate topics. That is on the one hand, mountain climbing, but on the other, you have vacationing in the high altitude resorts and spas that were to develop in the mountain region. For the discovery of the mountains led to the Carpathians becoming fashionable. The Carpathians as a whole are characterized by paradoxes. Although they are central in Eastern Europe's most prominent physical feature, which you see here on the map, uh, they bisect the region and serve as the watershed to the Baltic and Black Seas. Still, politically, they are peripheral. Various ranges within the Carpathian mountain system, and there are more than a few of them, delineate the frontiers of two countries, modern day Slovakia and Poland, while lying on the outskirts of others. That would be Austria, Czechia, Ukraine, Romania, and Serbia. Likewise, despite the fact that the Carpathians are essentially a continuation of the Alps, as you see on the map, uh, and are the second most extensive range in Europe after them, they are infinitely less well known. In my book, I look at the phenomenon of discovering the Carpathians historically from the 1870s to the 1980s that is for a little over a century, as it played out in three distinct ranges of the Carpathians. The Tatra Mountains, the Eastern Carpathian territory known as the Hutzel region, and the Bishtadi Mountains. Oops, went too fast on that slide. Here we go. To make a long story short, I argue that the Tatra Mountains were discovered circa 1873, the Hutzel region prior to and especially after World War I, and the Bishtadi Mountains after World War II. Now here comes the slide. Now you will not be wrong if you exclaim that why the Carpathians were already known by then. For example, how can it be that the Tatra Mountains were discovered in 1873 when already a year earlier, an English language travelogue promoting the region entitled Try Krakow and the Carpathians was published. The simple answer is that Britons were not the discoverers of the Carpathians, although they did penetrate parts of that vast mountain system, most often from the south. That penetration did not amount to a true discovery as I defined it in my book. Among other things, their various publications did not result in masses of compatriots flocking to these mountains. At least one person hailing from the British Isles, and here I have a slide of her, uh, distinctly wished to dissuade her compatriots from following in her footsteps. This despite the fact that she too wrote of her travels. No, the discoveries in my book came from lowlands of a different nature. And this is one of the paradoxes of my story. The people who discovered the Carpathians came from quintessential lowlands, from the land of the plains and the land of the steppe. In other words, they hailed from the Polish and Ukrainian lands. 
Please note furthermore that these were not residents of the nearby Piedmont, that is from Galicia proper, but rather came from somewhat farther away. Here you can think of places such as Warsaw or Kharkiv. The discovery thus can be construed as a center periphery phenomenon as well as an urban rural one. And another thing, the mountains they discovered were not the warm southern slopes of the Carpathians, but rather the colder, less hospitable northern slopes, the Galician frontier. In some, these discoverers had to travel farther and work harder to reach the mountains. They were, as I intimated, Poles and Ukrainians, not Slovaks, Hungarians, or Romanians, for whom access to the parts of the Carpathians was much more immediate and less challenging. So we know something of the parameters of my story. Yet an important question remains. What does it mean to discover lands already known and to some extent inhabited? For as many of you likely know, these rugged territories were inhabited by indigenous highland peoples known as Gurals, Hutsuls, Boikos, and Lemkos, not to mention other categories of people as well, be they state officials, noble landowners, clergymen, Jews, Roma, and so on. Yet the verb discover was used time and again, more specifically in each of the three episodes I treat in my book, to refer to the penetration of the mountain by outsiders coming from the lowlands. It was said that the Tatras were discovered, that we are discovering the Hutzel region, that we are rediscovering the Bishtade. How is one to understand this? I argue that the episodes of discovery in my book were conscious public attempts on the part of individuals and or institutions to appropriate and shape the region in question, that is to reshape the region in question, which they imagined as part of their patrimony. The discoverers also sought to settle it at least seasonally with sympath sympathetic individuals, those who understood the value of the mountains for society or even humankind. The discovering was done by members of the quintessentially urban population that we know as the intelligentsia. These individuals included bureaucrats, doctors, lawyers, teachers of all kinds, artists and writers, people who made a living with their brain, not their brawn. In some, the intelligentsia was the educated stratum of society. Its members often tended also to be nationally conscious, even bearers of the national idea. In other words, they were men and women with a mission. But first, they came to the discovery by thinking of themselves. In the summer, for that is when the earliest discovering began, they needed a break from both the mental stress of their jobs and the unhealthy urban environment in which they lived. The various mountain ranges of the Carpathian mountain system with their sublime vistas, invigorating streams and fresh mountain air provided precisely the type of rural environment they needed. It was a curative environment for many. The intelligentsia furthermore was a stratum of society that not only needed this kind of curative environment, but also had the time, that is vacation time, time off from work, and the money needed to be able to travel some distance to visit the remote mountains. My book thus centers on what happens when a certain mountain range was discovered, how that discovery changed the lives of the lowland populations that traveled to the mountains to hike or recuperate from the various lowland illnesses associated with urban settings. 
At the same time, the discovery would have repercussions not only for the region, which witnessed an influx of tourists, but also for the indigenous highland folk, the aforementioned Gurals, Hutsuls, Lemkos, and Boikos. The Highlanders were part and parcel of the package that was the Carpathians, part of the attraction of the region for the lowland elites. The Highland folk and their quintessentially Highland culture were what they were thanks to the mountains. The Highlanders were perceived by the intelligentsia as no less a part of nature than the natural environment, the mountains themselves. Let me focus for a minute on the Guraus and Hutsuls, both with their distinctive forms of dress, which you see here in the slide. In the case of the Hutsuls, quite colorful, as well as designed for a life astride their constant friend, the Hutsul horse. The Gural men decorated their hats with a certain type of seashell, suggesting that these populations were not as isolated as was imagined by the intelligentsia. The Highlanders were in the main shepherds. They led a semi-nomadic lifestyle, their summers spent on the high alpine meadows with their sheep. Their hard scrabble lands not suited to farming, Highlanders were also employed in the mining and especially in logging industries. Still, there was not enough work to go around. Highlanders thus were a hardy yet impoverished folk. Ultimately, the Highlanders would serve as guides and porters for lowland tourists. Yet those who knew the mountains best were not the shepherds familiar with only a valley or two, but rather the region's brigands. The most famous of these, Yura Janosik and Oleksa Dobush, were folk heroes of sorts. I expect you will hear more about them in May as Ksenia Kibushinsky has photographs of brigands that she might be sharing with you. Understood to be primordial and authentic, the distinctive music, songs, and dances of the Highlanders also attracted the attention of tourists who would come to see them as or Polish or or Ukrainian. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let me share with you several vignettes from my book, two from before World War I and one after World War II that shed light on the urban-rural encounter in the contact zone that was the Carpathians. The first discovery, the discovery of the Tatra Mountains, was credited to the Warsaw physician Titus Haubinski. Not only did he make a trip to the picturesquely located village of Zakopane with its views of the Tatras, with his family in 1873. When cholera reached the region that summer, that is a lowland disease coming to the highlands, the good doctor stayed to take care of the sick. In this way, he won the gratitude of the highlanders who in the years to come would welcome Haubinski en masse when he arrived for his summer stays. As a doctor who understood the benefits of the restorative alpine air, Haubinski began to recommend a Zakopane vacation to his patients. And indeed, many of the visitors came from the Russian Empire, from Warsaw and other parts of the former Polish lands. This helped to make Zakopane an increasingly popular summer destination. Already in 1873, the first Polish Alpine Club was formed. This was the Galician Tatra Society, soon to be known simply as the Tatra Society. The implications were that members of the society could come from beyond Galicia, as had Haubinski. Both Haubinski and the Alpine Club strove to promote the Highland region and its development. First, they had to improve access 
to the mountains. This meant constructing roads, among them a regular provincial road leading to Zakopane, where earlier travelers to the region had been subjected to a bumpy ride in covered wagons along the riverbed, which served as a road of sorts. It also resulted in the construction of a railway, first to Habufka, uh, and then by the end of the century, all the way to Zakopane, in this way shortening what had been a two-day journey from Krakow. They also lobbied for Zakopane to be recognized as an official climatic kurort, that is a high altitude resort. So as you see, the landscape was changing. The Gural Highlanders built housing for the guests in Zakopane, sanatoria were open to treat the sick, and the Tatra Society built huts and marked trails in the mountains proper. Howubinski devised a specifically Polish type of mountain climbing that was called Taternictwo. Lasting several days to several weeks, excursions in this style involved a number of highland guides and porters, as well as upper class poles. In addition to the scaling of the Tatra's highest peaks and passes, a highlight of the excursions was the communing of highlanders and lowlanders. This was seen in their enthusiasm for each other's company, as well as in the singing and dancing of highlanders around the campfire in the evenings. This grand style of taternictwo has also been referred to as excursions without a program, by which was meant the freewheeling style of mountain climbing practiced by the group, which at times fancied itself to be the brigands of yore, even firing shots in the air as they made their way in the mountains. At the same time, back in Zakopane, upper class Poles were discovering the charms of highland material culture the wooden cottages where every household object was intricately carved and decorated. It was posited that Highland culture was essentially the original old Polish culture, preserved in isolation in the mountains, free from the marks of foreign civilization felt so acutely in the lowland cities. Not only were upper class Poles captivated by the artistry uh, as they collected and even documented the designs. One individual was inspired to create a new style of architecture on the basis of the Highland Cottage, in essence, elevating it for upper class use. And here you see what was produced. This was the so-called Zakopane style of artist and activist Stanisław Witkiewicz. In this way, Highland inspired architecture made its way to the lowlands also, resulting in an interesting cross-pollinization of sorts, a, a hybrid culture. This hybrid culture could be construed in other ways as well. Polish literary culture also took inspiration from the Tatras to the extent that the turn of the century literary and artistic movement known as Young Poland, Moda Polska, was notably heavy on Tatra themes. And before the railway went all the way to Zakopane, the mountains went to Warsaw. This they did in the form of a panorama a huge painting in the round, 115 meters long and 16 meters high, for which a special pavilion had been constructed. Here you see just a, a piece of that. In this way, Varsovians could experience the Tatras and at the opening of the exhibition, even see real Highlanders who explained to visitors what they saw. By the end of the century, the Tatras had become a Le de Memoir, a true Polish icon. 
They were a recognizable national landscape. It became increasingly difficult to imagine a future Poland without the Tatras, so dear to so many hearts. In the wake of the discovery, upper class Poles were becoming closer to the indigenous Highlanders, who they increasingly thought of in or Polish terms. Self-confident, even feisty, with their distinctive form of dress and captivating culture, the Gurals, furthermore, were considered the most attractive of the Polish peasants. The interaction of lowland elites and highland peasants helped to strengthen the idea that a modern Polish nation could not consist solely of the former nobility, but had to embrace all layers of society, including the peasantry. Thus, we see how intertwined and interdependent the highlands and lowlands, highlanders and lowlanders had become. Now, this was the first discovery of the Carpathians. The Tatra experience led to interest being taken in mountains further east, in the Eastern Carpathians, in particular the region inhabited by the colorful highlanders known as Hutzels. Recognition of their impoverishment led a regional branch of the Tatra society to organize an ethnographic exhibition in 1880 one visited by none other than the emperor of Austria-Hungary, Franz Josef. But instead of going into the details of that visit, which resulted in orders of Hutzel handicrafts by the emperor and countless other visitors, I'd like to turn to a less well-known phenomenon, the development of spas and resorts, especially in the Prut River Valley in the decades prior to World War I. Anyone who has ever visited that region knows of its beauty, as well as its attraction for travelers. But few realize the region was blossoming as a land of health resorts in the 1890s and early 1900s. What initiated that development was the construction of the Stanislaw Voronenka Railway, connecting the city now known as ivano Frankivsk. Uh, with to Hungary via the Prut River Valley. You can see that section of the railway marked in yellow. The railway cut through localities such as Delatin, Dora, Yamna, Mikulichin, and Vorokta. With time, where sheep and cattle once pastured or timber was harvested, resorts sprang up. The most noteworthy of the Prut Valley destinations was the hamlet of Dora, known as Yaremche. Yaremche was picturesquely positioned along the railway line, where it had a train station of its own. It also boasted a beautiful view of one of the region's man-made marvels, an enormous railway bridge that spanned the Prut. At the time of its construction, it was the biggest stone bridge in the world. That piece of civilization in the wilderness would entice entrepreneurs, many of them civil servants in the Habsburg bureaucracy, to capitalize on the vistas, fresh air, and water. They began to build villas for themselves, as well as boarding houses and everything that might make for a pleasant and comfortable stay in what had been wild mountains. Now, what is a spa or resort, but an island of civilization in a beautiful natural setting? Certainly the entrepreneurs behind Yaremche touted its European look. They touted its man-made aspects, the streetlight-lid boardwalk, restaurants and bakeries, the Glorietta atop a nearby peak, a water truck to sprinkle what otherwise would be dusty streets, and so on. These features made Yaremche less a wild wilderness than a posh suburb of Stanislaw and Kolomea, when so many vacationers came. 
They breathe the Svige Luft, that is the fresh air, bathed in the Prut and took restorative walks. The hamlet had ambitions of becoming a second Zakopane for the province. And it came close, if in a distinctly Habsburg way. The high, high altitude resort of Yaremche became the destination of choice for many urbanites from Eastern Galicia. In 1912, it was visited by no less a personage than the Habsburg Archduke Charles, later to be the last emperor of Austria-Hungary and his wife Zita. There is actually a, a wonderful anecdote of a Hutzel hitching a ride with the archducal pair in their automobile, only to learn after the ride who they were. Please note that the cost of a summer vacation in Yaremcha did not come cheaply. According to another anecdote, the rich of Stanislaw vacationed in Yaremcha and the poor in Switzerland where the higher cost of travel was amortized by the lower cost of accommodations and food. So once more, one needs to emphasize that it was well-to-do urban elites who frequented this island of civilization in the larger Carpathian wilderness. In my book, I write about other summer destinations, including the village of Krivorivnya, it was frequented by Ukrainian elites from Lviv, such as Volodymyr Hnyatuk, Ivan Franko, and Mihailo Hrushevsky, the last of whom built himself a villa there, beautifully decorated with carved Hutzel furniture and handicrafts. Still, I argue that it was not these individuals, but rather Ukrainians from beyond the Galician frontier who were discovering the Hutzel region although they never used the term. Recall that Mihailo Kotsubinsky wrote his evocative Teni Zabutiv Predkiu, or Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, after a visit to Krivorivnya. And I'm sure you'll hear more about that in June from Joshua First, uh, when he talks about the famous film that was created in Soviet times. Yet, even more fascinating was the discovery of the Hutzels circa 1910 by Hnat Hotkevich. This writer and thespian from Kharkiv created a Hutzel theater with Hutzels acting on stage in plays such as Yusef Kozhenyovsky's Carpathian Highlanders. The Hutzel theater toured Galicia functioning in this way like the Tatra panorama had for Varsovians, that is, sharing something of the region and its rich culture with Galician lowlanders. A smaller version of the Hutzel theater subsequently toured in the Russian Empire. Only the outbreak of World War I put an end to the theater and ultimately ended up destroying much of the region's resort infrastructure, including Yaremcha which in 1915 was set ablaze by the retreating Russians. This is one reason why this story of pre-World War I development is so little known. Now, if the railway helped put Yaremcha and the Hutzel region of the Eastern Carpathians on the map, it would take the construction of roads, especially highways, to popularize the last of my discoveries, the Bishjade Mountains. Here we jump over the interwar period, about which I also write, to the period after World War II, with its drastically changed state borders. The Polish-Soviet frontier was set more or less at the border between what before the war had been called the Western and Eastern Bishjade which you can see here on the map. The Bishtade discovered by the Poles after the ravages of World War II were the Western Bishtade, with their border along the San River. These remote mountains had become the southeastern border of the Polish People's Republic, again, which you see here on the map. 
Yet that is not the sole reason why the Bishtadu were discovered after the war. World War II, the Holocaust, population exchanges, and the ethnic cleansing that was Operation Vistula had not only devastated and depopulated a region formerly inhabited by Lemkos, Boikos, and their neighbors. The Bishtade became a no man's land for the better part of a decade. It reverted back to a wilderness. The mountains were, in the words of tourism activist Władysław Krygowski, beautiful and wonderful for the eye of the tourist, by which Krygowski had in mind the active, even rugged tourist of the mountain climbing sort. Although wonderful for the eye of the tourist, the Bieszczady were a thorn in the side of the new Polish communist authorities. The Bieszczady of their dreams were repopulated with Polish workers and farmers, complete with large state agricultural farms, industries such as gigantic lumber mills, and hydroelectric power from the two new reservoirs constructed in the 1960s. The devastated rural region was to be transformed into a rural urban hybrid of sorts, one with an industrial feel. Hundreds of miles of asphalt in the form of two brand new highway loops were above all to make the region accessible for greater logging. The reservoirs were also not designed with the tourist in mind. If tourism had to reach the region, and who could resist its picturesque if wild charms, then the authorities thought it should be of the mass organized type. The preferred mode of strenuous activity were huge group hiking expeditions of several days in length. The preferred mode of stationary vacationing were organized vacation stays in special group accommodations for employees of a certain factory or industry. The construction workers unlovely housing in the vicinity of the reservoirs was transformed into such vacation homes, while other concrete buildings with a minimalist aesthetic also were constructed in the region. The authorities simply could not countenance a place where the individual tourist could hike freely. Yet that is what the discoverers of the Bieszczady wanted, a wild expanse for trekking. Not pre-war elites, these discoverers hailed from academia. In particular, they were students and junior faculty at the Warsaw Polytechnic and Warsaw University, many of them members of the Student Club of Beskid Guides, an elite hiking organization. The declaration of discovery in the early 1970s was made on the pages of the Polytechnics Weekly, Polytechnik, with the slogan, we are rediscovering the Bieszczady in Polish Odkrywamy powtórnie Bieszczady, the students launched a call for like-minded people to support a special plan for the development of the Bieszczady. Think of it as an anti-plan of sorts. The upper reaches of the Bieszczady were to be left as they were, now transformed into a trekker's paradise. This they labeled a tourist preserve. No development was to take place in the tourist preserve, but there would be plenty of room for resorts outside of its borders, especially in the vicinity of the reservoirs to the north of the tourist preserve. One of the discoverers, Janusz Rygielski, described the project as, I quote, an experiment that would permit us to avoid the standard type of development of recreational territories and move towards a futuristic model anticipating the needs of 21st century man. 
Rogielski had in mind that 21st century men and women would need a place to escape from an increasingly industrialized and polluted world into a freer, quieter realm where they could commune with nature. The plan for a tourist preserve gained no traction with the communist authorities. The latter wanted a free hand in the region to develop as only they could. To that end, they sent in not students, but scouts pouring concrete for numerous camps where the scouts would live while engaging in building the bishtade during their summer vacations. Logging, rock quarrying, and animal husbandry remained big business and even increased, while more and more roads crisscrossed the mountainous terrain. Development was haphazard, as was tourism much of which was done in wild fashion with little regard for the natural environment. What the students did not yet know was that the communist authorities were not totally against the idea of a preserve. Indeed, they proceeded to create out of a piece of the terrain along the Polish Soviet border, a secret hunting preserve. Communist bigwigs and their guests could shoot with impunity the plentiful wildlife. Deer, foxes, wolves, bison, which were reinduced into the Bishjada in 1963, and even bears, despite the latter being protected under law. Yet by the time the independent and self-governing trade unions known as Solidarity were established in 1980, the hikers of the student club of Besky guides, and especially those who lived in the region, foresters, farm workers, shepherds, knew of its existence. To make a long story short, in the early 1980s, during the solidarity period, students and their allies pushed back and to greater effect. Indeed, had it not been for the imposition of martial law in December 1981, it is likely the student plan for the functional division of the mountains with a tourist preserve for trekkers would have been realized. The clampdown on civil society during martial law, however, sounded the death knell for independent journalism, silencing Polytechnique and its writers. Only after communism came to an end would the situation in the Bishjade change. Let's stop here and sum up. Today I've tried to present to you several facets of the three discoveries of the Carpathians covered in my book. In the process of discovering discrete mountain ranges within the Carpathian mountain system, let's see if I can go back to this slide. Um, forget the slide, uh, urban elites from the center, paradoxically coming from territories that were indisputably lowlands, became enthralled with what were perceived as their highlands. We can think of these discoveries as attempts by the urban elites to claim and transform the undeniably rural landscape that was the highland wilderness. Let's review the examples I discussed today. In the period before World War I, a period of national insecurity for Poles and Ukrainians alike, the Tatras and their indigenous Guras were claimed by Polish elites for the Polish nation, while Hutzels found themselves attracting not only East Galician elites of varied national provenance, but also the cream of the Ukrainian literati, at least some of whom saw the Hutzels as Ur Ukrainians. In the 1970s, an age of growing industrialization in the East Bloc, the Bishtade were being claimed by the country's educated youth for posterity, that is for humankind, which even today needs a place to escape from a polluted urban environment. The mountains were both encountered and imagined as reflecting important values for the discoverers. 
And here I'd like to end by signaling an important legacy of the discoveries which opened these territories up to mass penetration, the need to strike a balance between preservation and development. The trick was not to let the urban overtake the rural, not to develop the region so much that nature, which attracted people to the region in the first place, became endangered. Thanks to the discoveries, mountains have been inscribed on the mental maps of lowland poles and Ukrainians. Let us hope that they and humanity more broadly will be able to delight in the Carpathians for centuries to come. I thank you for your attention, and look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is this beautiful, beautiful overview and a historical big span of uh, various encounters with the mountains uh, give us uh, uh, almost the fresh feeling of how these mountains were discovered and rediscovered by the urban intelligentsia urban elites from the lowlands and thank you patrice again for reminding us this beautiful story we have two commentators uh, for your presentation these are colleagues of mine who are affiliated with the center for urban history here in lviv uh, let me introduce them uh, irina sklokina she is a historian and she graduated as in kharkiv national university uh, just this to, to pin down the city again uh, that you mentioned uh, in your presentation. Uh, Irena defended her thesis uh, in 2014, uh, especially dedicated to uh, official Soviet policy of memory of the Nazi occupation of Ukraine. And she used the example of Kharkiv in her uh, research work. And before joining Center for Urban History, she worked at Kharkiv National University and the Kowalski Eastern Institute of Ukrainian Studies in Kharkiv. At the Center for Urban History, Irena researches historical heritage, in particular industrial and Soviet heritage in Kharkiv and Lviv and also Donbass region, which is contested recently. And I think she will find a lot of similarities and interesting aspects uh, in your last story, especially dedicated to Polish industrial uh, take on, on the mountain. So uh, please, Irena, uh, the floor is yours. Uh... Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very rich and a uh, very inspiring presentation and uh, thank you Patrice also for sharing uh, your paper beforehand uh, so I also enjoyed uh, this reading and uh, yeah thank you for inviting me to comment um, uh, so um, uh, I really think that uh, actually this research is uh, very inspiring in many ways and um, of course uh, uh, because it brings together uh, studies of nationalism, uh, environmental history, study of tourism, and um, uh, several disciplines more, I think. And um, uh, especially I liked uh, how actually um, uh, this uh, subject allows us to uh, bring uh, together um, uh, so many different groups and uh, points of view. So it's really a uh, a history of a contact zone. I think uh, my colleague uh, Alexei Chibatryo will uh, tell more about this and uh, how in fact uh, we can do um, a history uh, um, as a history of um, uh, encounters uh, and uh, transmissions and uh, transfers and not only as a um, kind of uh, um, uh, traditional approach to, to this issue in uh, strictly um, like national historiographies in Poland and Ukraine. Um, and uh, I uh, do uh, think it's uh, really a great uh, contribution into uh, historiography of this region and of course of so many other uh, regions which are also uh, border zones and uh, contact zones. 
Uh, as for uh, some of the um, issues which I would like uh, maybe to clarify, to ask you maybe to, um, uh, uh, to explain a bit more, um, uh, is actually your, uh, one, of, uh, uh, one of your statements uh, is um, uh, actually about um, uh, the um, interaction between your historical actors. So I found it very interesting, uh, your statement about impact uh, of uh, this um, uh, encounter on both sides. Uh, so this uh, urban um, intellectuals and elites, uh, urban people, then a bit more democratic crowd, uh, but still uh, more often uh, like urban people, educated people and uh, uh, somehow um, enlightened people uh, and the encounter with um, uh, uh, people from this uh, rural and local uh, beg background and obviously not from uh, uh, elite background. Uh, so in fact, uh, it's uh, very interesting for me if you can maybe um, explain more or give uh, some particular example. Uh, when do you think uh, this uh, kind of encounter uh, had uh, not only this extractive um, meaning, uh, but rather a meaning of uh, coexistence and mutual impact. Because uh, to me, it seems like uh, what you are talking about uh, looks like more um, uh, kind of uh, Benedict Anderson's uh, history about elites uh, who actually um, construct uh, the idea of the nation in this uh, smaller circle of uh, enlightened and educated people and then uh, basically transmit it uh, through kind of enlightenment uh, tools uh, to wider audiences and uh, basically um, that's what we see here. So these uh, intellectuals uh, actually, they only pick and choose what they would like to in these uh, mountains. They only kind of uh, see what they want to see. They only extract something uh, in order to justify their nation making projects. And uh, actually, for me, it's difficult to say uh, when and where actually um, uh, the um, the local people themselves, uh, Lemkos and Boykos, had uh, their own uh, subjective, uh, like active uh, position uh, in this dialogue. And uh, if they really had this chance to not only act, uh, so to say, in the theater, as you gave us an example of a theater, so did they only had a chance to perform under the guise of, uh, of uh, those who actually uh, set the scene and organized uh, the play and uh, uh, prescribed the roles, or uh, did they actually had a chance to become the regisseurs uh, themselves? Uh, so for me, it's actually a question. So um, was it in fact only extractive approach and um, uh, uh, and uh, actually something uh, something uh, more than that? Um, and uh, I uh, another question which is related to this one is um, uh, probably not a, a scholarly question, but more a question for for the future. If you can maybe give us an example of uh, also of non-extractive relations also between uh, people and the nature. So is uh, this uh, history from this part of the world, is it actually only once again about uh, this conquering the nature, civilizing the nature and destructing the nature or maybe there are some uh, really, I think, uh, inspiring examples uh, uh, which we can take for the future maybe um, related to this non-extractive cohabitation uh, or kind of different types of, of relations uh, which actually recognize uh, the subjectivity of the other, uh, the um, legitimacy of uh, alternative um, lifestyles and not only idealization or kind of uh, use um, of um, uh, of uh, local lifestyles uh, for the sake of uh, intellectual enterprise, uh, but maybe some kind of alternative kind of uh, encounters. Uh, also, uh, I think 
um, it's very interesting to look uh, at this um, um, socialist period, uh, which you uh, uh, also explain here in this presentation and also in your other very interesting article, which I read. And I think uh, probably here it's also quite interesting to see uh, where uh, at this period, because uh, actually um, then uh, the, uh, the, this mass tourism is already probably something different uh, from this earlier stage when only elites uh, were engaged. Uh, once again, in, in this nationalizing enterprise, in this nation building, in uh, Anderson's uh, sense. And actually, do you think uh, that this um, uh, socialist period made any difference in this situation? Or was it once again uh, the same type of nation building when uh, actually elite, but this time you, um, socialist elite, uh, just uh, spread uh, its vision from above, uh, just transmitted it uh, onto its subjects uh, through this enlightenment and propaganda and mass tourism and especially organized tourism. Mm, uh, so was it once again the same scheme of uh, intellectuals and the masses uh, being enlightened uh, by, uh, by these elites? Or uh, do you think that uh, actually this period uh, brought uh, something uh, like totally different uh, into, this, into this picture? Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, basically what uh, I would like to, uh, uh, to say at the moment. And um, uh, thank you once again for this uh, very interesting and engaging talk. And uh, I'd be uh, really happy to, uh, uh, to hear some more of explanations uh, from your side. Before Patrice proceeds, I just uh, want to add to this question, very similar comment from the chat from uh, one of the uh, uh, participants, Nancy Sinkov asks also, can Patrice speak more directly to the complexities of the issues of nationalism in the mountain and sentiments if there were of anti-urbanism as part of the hiking mountain climbing clubs? The other questions I will recite later, but uh, please, Patrice, the floor is yours. And if I may be, I'm, I'm sorry, I also think I forgot to pay attention to uh, one more very interesting thing here, and uh, actually it is addressed in this question about the complexities of the nationalism. I think also one of the big advantages of uh, this uh, lecture is uh, actually paying attention at uh, competing uh, national projects of uh, Ukrainians and Poles. Uh, but um, uh, for me, it's very interesting to hear more maybe about this competition because it was not only a kind of two separate processes when uh, Ukrainians and Poles separately tried to claim uh, the region and people, Gutsus, Boykos, Lemkos, Gurale, but uh, obviously it was also a process of uh, uh, mutual learning from one another and uh, competition and uh, probably some kind of borrowing uh, practices from one another. I, uh, I do think that both Ukrainians and Poles looked at uh, each, uh, each, uh, each other and uh, actually um, uh, do you pay uh, somehow bigger attention at these processes in your book? Probably do you look at some kind of uh, borrowing some models or approaches or tools um, actually both by Ukrainians and Poles. And of course, that would be also very interesting to know how do you present uh, the subjectivity of, uh, of uh, the local Carpathian people in your, in your book. And did you find any way to present also their indigenous subjectivities and uh, identifications and uh, uh, opinions on, on this process? Great. Should I answer now or should I wait for Oleksii? I think uh, we can go with the first set of responses and then uh -huh. Oleksii will be the second. Okay, well, let me thank Irina for wonderfully thoughtful questions uh, that she has posed for me today. Uh, indeed, 
one can say that what I have shown you today is sort of intellectually top heavy. Uh, you see the, the actors as being the intelligentsia and the acted upon tend to be, tend to be nature and the indigenous um, uh, locals, the, the Highlanders. Uh, I've always been trying when I was doing my research to find out as much as I could about the views of the locals, of, of the Highlanders. And I will admit in the period before uh, World War I, it is very difficult because so many of them were illiterate. There's not much of a paper trail that one has for their reactions, although there are certain things that, that I did see. And, and in the book, I try to flesh those out as best I can. Um, perhaps so one of the uh, most interesting responses would be that of the Hutzel theater members, some of whom uh, did leave a, a bit of a paper trail some reminiscences, uh, which I was able to use and was able to see, well, first of all, it's quite possible that it was a Hutzel who came up with the idea of the theater and not necessarily not Hotkevich. That is that the sources de debate over who was the one who, who actually thought of, of, of getting all the Hutzels together and helping them to present their life and culture to the rest of the world. Uh, there's a, a wonderful Hutzel, um, a, a literate Hutzel, who later in the interwar period would play even a more important role, who, do, who writes about how they were trying to show themselves as being equal to regular Europeans. And so you have this perception of Hutzels themselves being aware um, of outsiders' perceptions of them and them wanting to rise to the occasion. Uh, another Hutzel responded after touring Galicia and having seen how people responded en route, sometimes they, they, there were clashes uh, en route between different groups that they perceived because again, traveling through Galicia was an eye-opening experience for them as you may imagine. Uh, they said that they learned to conduct themselves better than some regular Europeans, you know, thinking about the, the people who had hosted them along the way. Uh, and so you get to find different bits and pieces like that. I mean, one has to tease them out because of course, there just isn't much in the way of sources. Um, one thing for the, the um, Tatra Mountain Highlanders, I could say, is that um, they were very, very grateful to have the um, uh, uh, intelligentsia members coming because it did so much for them economically. Uh, but they also had their own take on those sepre, which is a term that they would later use, the, the lowlanders, the people from outside, uh, that was, um, I'm trying to think how to express it. I mean, they, um, they, you know, they, 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 they almost laughed at them at times from the way that they behaved because of the, 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 the you know, the, they were so impressed by the way the, the Tatra Highlanders behaved and acted and could do this and could do that uh, to the extent that they thought that, that they were a little bit crazy in the head, these war, Warsaw intelligentsia types. So you, you get to see different things like that, but it's, it's really, it, it really was very hard to, to, to tease out some of these things in that period. Uh, although I tried to give as much subjectivity to the, uh, to the Highlanders as was possible. Uh, as regards the socialist period, well, indeed mass tourism made things different because you had different constituencies coming into the mountains. In the earlier period, those who came to the mountains knew something about tourism, by which I mean hiking. Uh, in the socialist period, getting the masses to come meant getting workers to come. And this is where you have the, 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 the beautiful uh, photograph that I think was probably the last one I showed you uh, with automobiles in the in the river and things like that with people not really knowing that you, you shouldn't do things like this. You will ruin the 
um, the, 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 the beauty of nature, if you ride your uh, automobiles through the water, wash your cars in the water uh, and things like that, this sort of wild tourism. So that was a very different bit of a, a situation. And uh, again, this, the students who were involved were um, people who came uh, certainly from the polytechnic. Some of them came from uh, what we would consider peasant families or uh, working class families, but they also became a sort of intelligentsia themselves. So you have different groups vying for influence here, different groups trying to shape the way the mountains were encountered, the way they should be encountered. I mean, that was part of the, the whole story of the rediscovery of the Bishtadu is that what we really need to do is to respect the region. Uh, and they also tried to respect the legacy, interestingly enough, of the um, Balemkos and Boykos who had lived there prior to them. This is something they don't write much about because it's a very sensitive issue uh, for the communists who really wanted to wipe them out entirely, wanted to get rid of them, wanted to turn Poland into a, a homogeneous society. But these, um, uh, individuals who were engaged in, in hiking through the region understood the remains of what of the society that had lived there before and wanted to help protect it. So there's all these different things that are going on there. But again, uh, I, I must say that the socialist period is, is quite distinct uh, from the earlier uh, period of, of what I would call more of a pure intelligentsia uh, experience, that you don't have the other layers of people. You also, uh, in the period of socialism, you have all the, the, the new peasants who come into the area to live and work in farms and collective farms and things like that. And they also uh, have their own distinct views of, of what the mountains are, what their value is, or lack of value is in some cases. And so it's, it's, it's a much more differentiated uh, a set of actors who come into play uh, in that period. Um, let me see what else I can say here. Um, Nancy's question about nationalism in mountains and anti-urbanism. Well, again, the anti-urbanism, as I tried to imply for the um, period before World War I, was an anti- uh, colonial urbanism, if you will. That is, the idea was is that the lowlanders lived in places like Warsaw, which was very highly shaped by the Russian empire, by Russian imperial authorities and the like. So having the nationalism in the mountains was turning it back to a pure earlier uh, period in history. I mean, it's sort of, they were very pre preservationist in a way wishing uh, to get to uh, a situation where they could grasp that old Polish culture that they thought they had lost elsewhere. Uh, a old Polish culture, furthermore, that was not shaped so much by serfdom because serfdom looked very different in the mountains than it did in the lowlands. It was one of the reasons why these highlanders were so interesting because they weren't so subservient and suspicious as were the, 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 the lowland peasants. Um, so I think the mountains prove a really wonderful place to be able to uh, sort of see, to, to look back on the urban environment from a, from a new vantage point. And it's that vantage point that I, that I find so compelling uh, in this discovery that you can you can actually uh, perceive the problems you have back home and translate them differently uh, in the mountains and perhaps even find solutions to them in the mountains. So I think I will end with that. Oh wait, one last thing, competing national projects. I can't forget the last question that Irina posed. Um, yes, indeed, you certainly have Ukrainians uh, seeing what Poles are doing uh, in the Eastern Carpathians. And just to give you an example from this um, pre-World War I period, uh, you had places like Yaremce being called a Polskie Misto, a Polish town. Whereas you had 
Ukrainians from places like Stanislavu, from Stanislav, Stanislav, whatever you want to call Ivano Frankis back in the day, very concerned about the Hutzels being turned into uh, 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 sort of being de de uh, deracinated, being uh, turned into something other than Ukrainians, which is what they wanted them to, to, un, to feel like. And so what they did is they started trying to develop the, the village of Dora, uh, not quite in the same way, because I don't think they ever built as many villas and the like, but they would travel up for the weekends and they would have programs and lectures and things like that. Someone even called it or referred to it at one time as a Hutzel University going on. So they were they were out trying to 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 do the best they could to keep the Hutzels from becoming uh or certainly from becoming Polish, uh, but also to, to keep them to, to turn them into Ukrainians, which I think was part of that nation building project. So there's some interesting things going on there. I, I won't give you any more examples, but that's one I that I really enjoy talking about. Uh Thank you, Patrice. Uh, we can move on uh, to my uh, to, to our second uh, commentator, my, uh, the colleague of mine, uh, Oleksiy Chibotaryov, who is affiliated with the Center for Urban History, but also with uh, the University of St. Gallen. Oleksiy received his degrees uh, in history from Ukrainian Catholic University and also uh, National University in Kharkiv. Uh, this year, uh, he defended thesis uh, at the University of St. Gallen, at the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. And he is involved in academic projects devoted to multicultural history and heritage and traumatic pasts in Eastern Europe. And he also uh, is interested in contact zones and uh, uh, issues that were raised during this lecture. So please, Alexei. Thank you for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. I'm excited to be part of this first event uh, for Carpathian program. <clears throat> first of all, I would like to uh, thank Professor Dombrowski for uh, this fascinating presentation. I'm following your work for many years, and uh, like many of uh, our listeners today, I'm looking forward to read uh, your first coming book. I will try to not repeat questions already raised by Irina and will be skipping some of uh, some parts of my notes. Uh, to, to keep my remark to my remarks on your presentation short, uh, I'll I will divide it on uh, into four uh, points that are built on the issue touched in the presentation. Uh, the first point uh, I want to. Uh, focus on is discovery of distant and simply unknown regions for the mass visitors at the end of uh, 19th, and, uh, 19th century and uh, the first half of 20th century. I'm glad uh, that uh, Patrice already mentioned this parallel between Carpathians and Alps. Indeed, uh, the history of discovery and promotion of these regions can, has uh, many, many similarities. Uh, similarities. And uh, for example, in the early 1890s, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle visited a small mountain village in Eastern Switzerland. He was one of the first to cross to uh, the extremely high mountain pass on uh, cross-country skis near this village. When he reported uh, this story in uh, London's uh, Strand magazine, this unknown place became uh, enormously pop popular among British and other European travelers. Even today, uh, the village of Davos remained one of the most famous uh, destinations in the Alps. However, with these uh, comparisons, uh, we may go much further than co uh, comparison of Davos with Yeremcha or Krivorivnia. In this uh, period, for example, uh, visits to overseas territories by Europeans also became quite popular. So uh, we are talking here about um, Mm, a new international trend when not only a panorama of uh, Carpathians uh, appeared in Warsaw, but also a lot of unknown peripheries were advertised in the capitals or uh, in uh, other cities. 
Probably one of the most known examples are posters of London Underground from the 1930s. They were entitled uh, Visit the Empire. Uh, this, this project of London Undergrounds gave people in London an image of the regions uh, of the British Empire, such as Australia, New Zealand, or India. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask Professor Dombrowski how uh, you approach and conceptualize all this uh, huge pool of different media about Carpathians uh, produced in the late 19th and uh, especially in the third half uh, of 20th century, because it's really different type of sources which originated not only in different time and different languages, but generally it's uh, hard to imagine how you uh, can combine all these sources in uh, in one research. So uh, I would like to hear about your experience uh, on this. Um, personally, uh, it's quite, uh, I see this uh, media as contact zone. It's quite obvious uh, uh, concept to uh, apply here. And uh, this moves us to my second point, which is uh, about colonialism. Uh, the mentioned London's underground posters and the use of colonial images uh, is, it's of course, a clear manifestation of colonialism. And uh, the, um, the function of such images uh, in uh, centers of empire was to promote, to move closer, or to make uh, more real these uh, far destinations, these overseas colonies. And here I would like to ask you about Carpathians. So this media that you have studied for your book, uh, this media that were promoting Carpathians in Habsburg or Polish cities, uh, uh, did they uh, uh, have the same functions or there was something special about them? How global was this trend in our part of Europe? Um, also, uh, the concept of uh, contact zone, which was developed by uh, Mary Louise Pratt, proposed that the production of knowledge about distance peripheries in the center is an essential part of colonialism. And uh, I actually wonder if colonialism or internal colonialism uh, as a concepts are presented in your research uh, and uh, what is your thoughts about uh, limitations uh, of implementation of these approaches for Carpathians. Mm -hmm. um, my third point is about nationalism. It was uh, already partly right, so it's a uh, well-known idea that gro growth of nationalisms in uh, the 19th century created a demand for creation and representation of uh, <clears throat> national landscapes for the spatial aspects of national imagination, nature, such as mountains or water courses, provide a significant point of reference and, and has been uh, appropriated as symbols of national vitality. Uh, only a few studies actually addressed uh, the issue of nature as spatial component of uh, national idea uh, in Eastern Europe and uh, publication of uh, Patrice Dombrowski on Carpathians have a significant place among these studies. Um, as you have mentioned in the presentation, Carpathians was uh, a, a southern frontier for Poles. Uh, we can clearly see that, uh, for example, from the ethnographic uh, map created by Roman Dmowski that uh, was later used for Polish territorial claims after the First World War. Uh, it is well known that in the same period, Ukrainian ethnographic maps and territorial claims uh, of the same period also include Carpathians. However, today uh, in political or even in historical context, when we are talking about contested territories of, Pol uh, of, uh, of Poland and Ukraine, we rather discussed uh, Galician and Volinian territories along the contemporary border than the mountains. Uh, I wonder if you approach the Carpathian Mountains as contested areas of two uh, national projects, and what were the differences in the use of 
this uh, mountains image by Ukrainian and Polish nationalism in the 20th, in 20th century. Perhaps all this question may also lead to already partly right question of when and how did the girls learn that they are Poles and uh, uh, the Hutus that they are Ukrainians, but we probably don't have time to uh, discuss it so uh, broadly. And uh, my four, uh, four point was about historical actorness of um, mountain population, as well as historical actorness of nature and uh, environment itself, but it, uh, it uh, I will skip it. Uh, this was already raised by Irina, um, the question of actorness. Yeah, and finally, I want to thank you again for your excellent presentation. Look forward to our discussion and uh, feel free to not answer questions that was already <laughs> questions that was already answered. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you very much for another set of wonderful quest, uh, questions raised and, and points made. Um, you're interested in media and how media was, uh, was used to advertise, to promote uh, the Carpathians. And here, uh, let me turn for a moment to the interwar period that I didn't talk about today because that you can see more use of, of media and other creative ways of promoting the mountains besides say, of course, something like the uh, Tatra Panorama, which in itself was a, a big form of mass medium. I mean, the panorama was a form of mass medium in the 19th century, the precursor to uh, uh, motion pictures, because again, you could walk around and see the whole thing. So it was, and they were extremely popular in Western Europe, um, as well as in Central and Eastern Europe. But you have, you know, a lot of, a lot of posters poster art being done during this time, but you also have um, events to promote uh, the region. And here I would just want to signal two of them. Uh, and these were uh, advertised abroad uh, as well as in the, the, the uh, interwar Polish state. One of them was a special ski train um, they referred to it as, let me see if I can get this right, uh, dancing skis bridge. In other words, what you can do on this train is you're traveling from literally one mountain destination to another. So you have people starting off in the Tatra Mountains or probably in Krakow, going up to Zakopane, coming down through the Carpathians and ending all the way up in the Hutzel region in places like Vorokta. Uh, and all the while, at every, every every night, they end up in a new destination. They're able to ski during the the, the evenings. They can play bridge or dance or whatever. And it was a such an interesting form of advertisement that it won some sort of award in Western Europe for its creativity. So that would be one way in which these things were being advertised abroad. Another way is also very interesting, a way of polls, and this is uh, maybe claim, um, combining some of your, your questions, uh, ways in which polls tried to claim that entirety of the Carpathian mountain region uh, to make it secure for the Polish, uh, uh, Polish statehood because that was a very important thing again during the interwar period. I mean, you can talk before World War one of, of Poles dreaming of borders as Ukrainians dreamed of borders, but that was before the war and everything was pretty much, uh, you know, there were, there were less drawings of, of actual uh, borders, so to speak. Uh, in the interwar period, you had um, what they called the Highland Holiday. Uh, this was um, an event in which you had Highlanders from across the entirety of the Polish Carpathians, because that's of course how they would refer to them, who would come together dressed in their, their Sunday best and uh, they would perform, uh, not performing plays like the Hutzel Theater, but rather performing the ethnographic uh, uh, material that is in singing songs, uh, showing a, um, a, a wedding ceremony, showing, sh sharing their songs and dances, all of that was done. And this was a great way of promoting 
the region uh, to uh, the rest of the country and beyond. So for example, in, I think it was um, 1935, in Zakopane, you had all of the Highlanders coming together and uh, essentially being, uh, uh, being well taken care of, being able to win awards for their performances, in some of them very concrete awards, which they could take back uh, home and, 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 and be enriched by. Uh, and all of, all of this was being done uh, to help them feel closer to this state in which they lived because Highlanders weren't necessarily thinking of themselves in Polish terms. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Gurale, uh, the, the, in, in Zakopan, they were probably the most Polish thinking ones, but uh, elsewhere, I mean, if they didn't have, they, if, if before the war, they didn't have that sort of contact with these upper class intelligentsia types who were trying to uh, convince them that they were Polish, then they may or may not have been so, um, so dedicated to the idea of Polish statehood. And this is something that they strove for uh, in, the, uh, in the interwar period. Now you ask about uh, colonialism. Of course, this is, this is the elephant in the room that um, uh, comes up all the time when you think about these interactions. And again, I would think that it, it, here again, it, it does depend on the period when this is most important. Um, certainly, in the period prior to World War One, I, I mean, I, I think it's more, it's it's less colonialism than consciousness raising that we actually have these mountains out there, um, that they are our mountains. Historically, there are mountains, and the people within them are our Highland peasants. Uh, you could see a little bit more of, 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 of a colonial approach to this in the Eastern Carpathians when you look at the way Poles reacted uh, uh, in 1880, if you remember the slide I had of the ethnographic ex exhibition. During that exhibition, uh, about which I've written elsewhere as well, uh, you have a situation in which the the Polish population of Galicia, certainly the Polish elites, are trying to show that they are indeed masters of and controllers of what happens in Galicia and that all the peasants uh, of the region can, can be brought under their umbrella, so to speak. Uh, and this is something that they're trying to show to the emperor himself, in other words, to buttress their positions uh, within Galicia, among other things, as well as to convince the locals that um, that they that that they are near and dear to the uh, to the emperor. That is, that some of his um, halo will rub off onto the nobility because they are being associated with him. They're the ones bringing him into the region. Um, so you you have this. I try not to deal with colonialism in in a very theoretical sort of way. Uh, of course, you can speak of some sort of internal colonialism, I think, uh, but there are limits to that as well. And uh, here I have to refer back to my mentor, Roman Sporluk, who when asked about colonialism in this part of the world, always told me that, well, there's, there's not that same sort of a glass ceiling that there was in other parts of the world, you know, it it was it you you had an easier way of inter integrating the Highlanders into the nation uh, than you than you did say integrating uh, um, uh, Hindus into the British nation, and um, so I I think that this is this is you know it it. The people that I deal with are very much invested in, in, in incorporating these people into their national projects. Uh, and uh, they have, a, I think, a, a slightly different perception of them than, say, the, the, um, the, the Brits do of, of, of their colonial peoples. 
I guess I, I will leave that there at that uh, with, with that answer at there. I'm trying to read my notes. Um, uh, again, oh, talking about, I, I think I, I talked a little bit about the, the this being a component of the national idea. So I, I will I will leave that. Perhaps someone else will ask a question that will bring this up more. Okay. Th thank you, Patrice. I'll read some questions from the chat. Uh, some of them you already uh, uh, discussed, uh, like uh, Marta Hrenyuk also mentioned this colonial aspect, uh, but I think she unpackled this. Uh, Raluca uh, Chernahoski uh, asks uh, about the Tatra Society that you mentioned, uh, the founding of Tatra Society in 1873, but she also uh, talks about uh, other societies like Austrian, German, Hungarian. They have uh, established nearly at the same period, even earlier than Tatra society, like Transylvanian, German, and some, some yeah. others. So her question is, how do you read its, uh, these uh, uh, the same similar uh, events and then also the, the importance of Tatra society within this larger movement around Carpathians and tourism. Uh, a question from Philip Herza is about uh, interwar period. Again, you, you, you tackled some points about this, but uh, the question comes from Czechoslovak side, which you don't touch upon. And we, of course, know that Czechoslovakia during interwar period had a special uh, relation to uh, mountains, to the mountains. And uh, the question is made me uh, thinking about continuity. So the question of Philip is uh, rather like command uh, that uh, you, you're a bit skipped uh, like this interwar story. Uh, but uh, in his perception, this was the prelude for the socialist history. So this interwar period explains a lot what happened during socialist era. And maybe one more a uh, comment from Darius Stola. Uh, how did cultural history of the discoveries which you have presented combined with the capitalist penetration of these peripheral regions, including extraction of natural resource? So mm -hmm. that, that's fine for now. Uh, mm -hmm. The floor is yours, yeah. Absolutely, thank you for those three questions. Um, the first one dealing with the Alpine societies, absolutely perfect point being made. Uh, the Polish uh, Gal uh, Galician Tatra Society came literally on the heels of the Hungarian uh, Alpine Club that was founded exactly that same year in, in 1873. Uh, so uh, the uh, and uh, and of course these came on the heels of the um, well, the, of course, the English one came way earlier. Then you have the the uh, Austrian and German clubs. Uh, later on comes the French, Italian, and others. I mean, this is an air er, a, a period in which Alpine societies are proliferating, and Poles are not uh, unaware of this. In other words, they're not acting in a in a vacuum. So, in in some ways, it's very interesting that the same year, 1873, happens to be identified with Howubinsky. It seems more a coincidence in some ways. Uh, I don't know the, if he was the one who pushed them over the edge to found this Alpine society. Uh, I don't think that that was necessarily the case. I think that these ideas were already percolating out there, but again, it fits in very well with this whole narrative. So um, uh, again, all the countries in the region were founding their societies at that time. I mean, Galicia was different in that it was not a country. It was simply a province of Austria-Hungary. So they they had to be much more careful about how they stepped, how they labeled this, this uh, uh, organization, who they were able to admit and things like that because uh, the, the authorities might not have been so keen on it being a Polish Alpine society out of Galicia. So it was slightly different, but again, they're, they're very much 
uh, aware of what is going on. Um, and uh, I know one scholar has drawn connections between the Italian Alpine society and people acting there and some of the people who had an influence on starting uh, the Galician or uh, Tatra society. So great question. A uh, question from, I believe, Philip about the interwar continuities and seeing this as a prelude for the socialist era. I think this is a very interesting observation. Um, I, I wish I knew more about what kind of continuities he sees. I, I, I still tend to see it as being uh, a slightly different, it being an era unto itself the way that things played out in the Polish Carpathians, although um, they too, I'm sure were aware of what was going on in the Czechoslovak Carpathians. In fact, uh, as I'm sure you know, there were negotiations to open the borders in the mountains and allow people to uh, hike in the mountains across the borders, that is without uh, having to worry about having crossed the border on the basis of their own uh, a hiking club um, documentation. So there's, there's that going on during there. Uh, the socialist era is much more closed as far as the borders go. I mean, there when you have um, in the 1970s and 80s um, uh, uh, opposition, oppositional figures meeting secretly up in the mountains. I mean, this is something that is not allowed. I mean, you're not supposed to contact, you're not supposed to cross borders and the like. So I'd, I'd have to think a little bit about that being a prelude for the socialist uh, era. Um, Darius's question about extraction. Uh -huh. Yes, well, one of the things uh, about the mountains and about their being known prior to the discovery has to do precisely with extraction. These areas were being economically developed prior to the discoveries. In fact, one might even talk about them having been economically developed, or certainly looking at the Tatra case. And then the people, the, the, the owner of the Zakopane domain uh, decides not to develop further. And this is when you have the, the, the highlanders in a quandary. They can no longer be employed in the logging industry or in uh, the uh, mining industries, but mostly the mining industry that went first. And so they're on hard times. So the discovery comes in interestingly at a mo moment of hardship in the highland community, which also makes for better linkage between highlanders and lowlanders because they are uh, coming in and helping with the economy. But mountains are, are traditionally a place of extraction. What do we get from the mountains? We get ores, we get rock, rock quarrying, uh, water, of course, uh, there's, there's all kinds of things uh, uh, done, even you have uh, say in the uh, Eastern Carpathians, you had a, a tiny bit of, um, well, I don't want to call it an industry, but you did have nobles traveling, traveling up into the mountains to, for, to take the waters uh, prior to this period. I mean, that was just a very uh, small segment of society. It wasn't the intelligentsia per se that I seem to uh, find in my discoveries, but uh, extraction is certainly very important. And, and there's a legacy of extraction uh, in the region. And there are people who after the discovery also want uh, even in the Tatras to, to uh, extract more, to uh, quarry rock and things like that. And you have the uh, groups of people trying to preserve the Tatras and trying to uh, exploit the Tatras. So there's all of this going on as well. You can mute my mic. Uh, in the lower bar of, uh, of Zoom, you have these beautiful reactions. So of course you can give us a sign of heart and applause, or you can raise the hand and, and uh, put the question aloud if you will. Uh, so let's have some few more minutes. We have 15 minutes more uh, to end up. Uh, there is a question from Irene Tomaszewski, please. Uh, 
you need to unmute your uh, account. Yes. I'm afraid I clicked on the wrong thing. I don't have a question. I did make a comment. Okay. <laughs> uh, lecture. And thank you, Patrice. Um, I hope that someday we'll be able to invite you up to Canada to give a talk on this um, because it was very seductive introduction to the mountains and a very seductive interest to, uh, seductive to the uh, social history as well with all its uh, complexities and tensions which I think every country now knows about with indigenous populations and so on. So I apologize for clicking on the wrong button. <laughs> But nevertheless, it gave me an opportunity to thank Patrice personally. And thank you all for organizing this. Now, what uh, I unmute myself. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Irene, for that nice comment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Irene. Uh, there was a comment uh, about the representation. Maybe you, of course, I understand you don't have images or pictures. The question was about the Soviet socialist period, how actually uh, the powers represented these locals, Highlanders, uh, on posters or in other visual media, but maybe you can just generally uh, comment whether you see some special attitudes in representation or they just, you have the long same story of uh, urban elites showing these local Arcadia peasants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. I will admit that in my book, I don't really go be. Uh, too deep into the Soviet socialist period, certainly not into the um, uh, the Eastern Carpathians, which then become part of, of the Soviet Union. Uh, I think we we all know that that Russians also took a very uh, great interest in what was going on in the mountains, although uh, they were off limits for a certain period of time too, due to uh, uh, political problems. Uh, in the uh, Bishade Mountains, um, again, you have this um, interesting uh, presentation of the of 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 the the mountain region as as being a place where we can go in and develop that tourism uh, in the mass uh, in a mass way. It um, I actually don't have much on special media, oh wait, I accept I do. Um, film was a great way of, of them uh, showing off the region. And you have, um, what do they call those? Film reels before that you show before movie theater uh, productions and things like that, or short clips uh, that uh, were uh, used to advertise. Um, Another way, uh, another thing very interesting in the Bishchade is the comparison to the Wild West. And so you have, for or the Wild East for that matter, because you have the Bishchade standing in for the Wild East in historical films. You also have cowboys figuring in, yes, indeed, cowboys figuring in the Bishchade. Uh, and uh, that gets a whole new young generation excited about the Bishtad. Uh There was um, a beautiful spread in one of the, um, uh, in, in Przekroj, one of the Polish periodicals. And there were countless letters to the editor from all kinds of young people saying, how can I become a cowboy? So, you know, different things like that are going on during this period, which I, which I find fascinating and do also write about a bit in the book. But I, again, I don't take, I, I, I deal with the micro histories that are with different episodes throughout the, the, uh, the region, not focusing on the Tatras through all of history, the Eastern Carpathians through all of history and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, this was intense. Two hours almost uh, discussing discoveries of uh, the Carpathians. And thank you, Patrice, for giving us this beautiful journey through the history and then through the various regions. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining this uh, online uh, lecture. Uh, this was the keynote lecture for the series of events that will take place every month up until June. And uh, I'd like to thank also to our commentators, Alexi and Irina, and all others who 
raised questions, listened attentively to arguments and have your own opinions. Thank you very much. And uh, I, uh, I'm happy to finish our first lecture. Uh, so if uh, there is no other comments or questions, and yeah, peacefully uh, I just go. thank you again for the invitation. <laughs> I look forward to the rest of the series. Great. Yeah. And I think that that's thank you, Patrice. And it's, I think it's also we could just announce that there will be the next lecture in your chat. And we will, today we talked a lot about Polish and Ukrainian. And the next lecture will actually bring in uh, not that often spoke, but some very important part of Jewish presence in imagination in Carpathians. And uh, Vladislava Moskalets will talk about barons and peasants not necessarily the first imaginary association you have uh, about um, Jewish um, presence in mental and physical scapes, uh, spaces of Carpathians at the end of April, 21st of April. Um, it would be nice to see you again in Zoom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you. And once again, Patrice, we are looking forward for your book. Yeah, we are looking forward for your book. Thank you.